Okay, so today's speaker is Dr. Andrew Winter, and he's a Humboldt Fellow at Heidelberg University, Germany, and he did get PhD at University of Cambridge with Kathy Clark, and uh, then went to postdoc at the University of Leicester. And then he started um, Humboldt you know, Fellowship from actually this year, right? This summer, yeah, spring. Much, yeah. So Andrew, yeah, Andrew's <laughs> research area is very interesting and uh, says he works on influence of basically the um, stellar birth environment on uh, proplanetary disk, especially on dispersion and evolution and theoretical approach. So I've been reading a lot of his papers recently. Um, uh, he's he focuses on external photo evaporation. He also has a paper of an encounter flybys in proplate lifetime. And now uh, there was a nature paper about um, a, a trying, trying to explain ex extra, actually uh, external photo evaporation and also the uh, planetary architecture, if I remember correctly. And we'll hear about um, his exciting research. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Serena. And um, thanks everyone for, for taking a bit of time out of the JWST uh, deadline just before JWST deadline. Um, so yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, how we can start linking the physics of star formation and, and planet formation. Um, and so, uh, oh, I can't, sorry. I'm just, oh, is this, oh, I'm sorry. This is immediately screwed up. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. It looks like it's sharing multiple pages. Uh, Sorry, I'm just going to stop stop sharing again. I mean, I've just been ready for, for ages, and then what's happened with this email on the side? But I'll figure that one out later. Anyway, um, so uh, so just to, to I'm going to give a, a relatively broad overview of a few of my sort of interests. Uh, I'm going to start just by um, touching base on exoplanet demographics, and then and then I'm going to talk about what kind of influences um, we might expect there to be due to the star formation environment on planet formation and evolution. Um, and then I'm going to sort of talk specifically, as Serena mentioned, about externally irradiated planet forming disks. And, uh, and then finally, and then I'm going to try and make, suggest how we can make the first steps towards connecting these to actual observed exoplanet properties. Um, so yeah, so to, just to start out, um, this is probably a familiar plot to everyone. Um, this is just from the NASA Exoplanet Archive um, with the semi-major axis uh, and planet mass of, of known exoplanets. Um, a lot of transit discoveries uh, in green and radio velocity discoveries in, in orange. But what we can see is immediately, uh, even though, I mean, this is still the subject of a lot of selection biases, even, even, even still, a lot of these planets are a lot more massive than, than the solar system, than, uh, than the planets you, you get the solar system at similar separations from the host star. Um, so, so they seem very different from, from what we expect for the solar system. And the other thing is that we have these strange things called hot Jupiters, that very massive planets orbiting close to the host star. How did they get there? Like, and, and this is this is a still a, um, a, a big problem uh, in astronomy. We, we don't know how hot Jupiters um, reach their current orbits. Um, models trying to explain this, these demographics can usually consider star disk interactions um, within a isolated system and then the planetary system evolution subsequent to that. Uh, and so as a result, your population synthesis or a parameterization would implicitly assume one continuous population. Um, and, and as a result, you, you end up with um, trying to fit this, this distribution with a large number of parameters. Um, and in a Bayesian sense, that's, that's quite difficult to do. And, and you're, you're reduced to very small regions of parameter space because you have to reduce yourself to, to one survey. Um, so it, it's quite difficult to interpret the demographics, uh, the demographics that we see. That we see. Um, just to very briefly introduce uh, protoplanetary disks, where, wherein these planets must more, must form. Um, there's, this is just the sort of review paper by Phil Armitage in 2011, but the, basically the, the, the processes that are hypothesized to operate on protoplanetary disks um, is still the same. And we have, we have a diverse range of possible um, processes, um, including dust settling, viscous evolution, so the spreading of the disk, the mass flux inwards and outwards, um, possibly due to viscous effects or possibly the accretion of the central star might instead be governed by um, magnetohydrodynamic winds. Um, and you also potentially have uh, photo evaporation or magnetic, other magnetic winds depleting the disk. We have a rich diversity of possible mechanisms which determine um, exoplanet architectures. Um, 
But these this to make this more complicated, this, these this just and this is what I will try and convince convince you of is that these disks are not going to be evolving by themselves. Um, and as as I said, that I'm going to be focusing mostly on this external photo operation, which is the irradiation by UV photons from neighboring OB stars and star forming regions. Um, but also the common processes include dynamical encounters between a star and an, uh, a, a, in the disk, um, a neighboring star in a disk. This can be in a protoplanetary disk or it can be within a protoplanetary system. Um, and also chemical enrichment by supernovae and winds. Uh, and this can, this can lead to um, heating and it can lead to drying out of the planets and formation of terrestrial planets. Um, and, uh, and is another possible mechanism that could have been important in the solar system itself. Um, so to, to focus again on external photo evaporation, uh, what, what do I mean? Again, um, so the first evidence of photo evaporation occurring was from the Orion Nebula cluster, uh, where stars are radiated by this, this, this massive 37 solar mass, 37 um, theta 1c. And what you see are these beautiful cometry-like structures. Um, and this is a HST image of a propylid. Um, you, and what you're actually seeing is an ionization front. So, so in this in this sort of model of what we're seeing here, you have uh, FUV photons that can penetrate down to the disk surface, heat up the disk, um, photo dissociate molecules, and this drives a thermal wind, which essentially shields the disk from the extreme ultraviolet photons, which then illuminate uh, this bright cometary structure. Uh, and this is what you see as a propylid. Um, but you don't necessarily need to have a propylid in order to have um, rapid mass loss rates. A lot of work's been done on um, FUV induced mass loss rates, uh, which can be coupled, uh, which couple uh, PDR calculations um, with disk wind solutions. So there's a few examples of papers that are doing that. Tom Howarth has published uh, a grid uh, of models, which can be used just to, to, to estimate the mass loss rate, uh, given your disk properties and your FUV flux. Uh, in this figure on the right here, what I've done is just um, taken a viscous disk model uh, so a, a disk just uh, expanding radially, radially and accreting onto the central star, and you apply these mass loss rates calculated from this grid. Um, and for different FUV fluxes, um, which are measured in G0, which is just multiples of the, the sort of solar, uh, the average, the volume averaged um, solar neighborhood value uh, of the FUV flux. Uh, as, as a function of this, you can see uh, on the y-axis, you can see how uh, the disk radius, which is the color bar, evolves over time. Uh, and for a a thousand or a few thousand G naught, you can really see fairly rapid depletion and truncation of these protoplanetary disks. So we expect that, that in this sort of regime, you might have a real significant effect on the mass budget available for planet formation. So with this in mind, we can sort of think about what the demographics are of local star forming regions. Um, and, and, and we can even think about what a probability density function of formation environments might be. Um, uh, and so this is just um, uh, this is a plot from my uh, from 2018 paper uh, where we look at just the the um, demographics of some star forming regions in terms of their their number density uh, and their FUV flux, and you can see these sort of tracks these tracks in um, density FUV space. But the take home point here is that so this um, this blue line here is the line at which we sort of say that okay so above that line you get fairly rapid disk depletion by photo evaporation, and what you can see is that um, a, a lot of disks really sit above that line. A lot of regions have a significant fraction of their, their protoplanetary disk population above this line. In fact, uh, I'm not going to go into detail on this one, but many regions um, are at sufficiently high disk to deplete um, protoplanetary disks, and, and we can estimate that around 50% in the solar neighborhood might lie close to or above that, that line, that threshold of a thousand or a few thousand um, G naught. So this is, a, this is really expected to be a significant effect, even in the solar neighborhood. Um, However, the other thing, so I, I just point out the other the other feature of this diagram was that there's this threshold drawn on um, for encounters as well, or this sort of red line on um, this red vertical line at 10 to the four stars per cubic parsec. And this is the sort of canonical threshold above which you'd expect random encounters happening um, to really start to truncate a disk within a few million years, um, within the sort of typical lifetime of a protoplanetary disk. Um, but that's not the whole story, because in reality, what we have is a star forming region where, where stars are forming hierarchically, forming in high order multiples, uh, dynamically decaying and undergoing chaotic interactions. Uh, and, and this is really, uh, I think, uh, the paper by Matthew Bate and, um, a couple of years ago uh, really summarized this really well. Um, you can see in, in those models um, how, how the sort of 
forming stars interact and decay, and um, this can set your initial distribution of disk radii. So what you can see here is the, the cumulative distribution uh, function of the disk radii from the model, um, which is the black line, uh, com uh, compared to the sort of uh, the observed class zero disks. And you can see there's a pretty good, pretty good match there. So this is sort of suggesting that this, this hierarchical decay might actually explain how the initial conditions of disks are formed. And this is a bit different from necessarily uh, the environment in terms of the, um, the dense environment changing the, the protoplanetary disk properties. But it, but it is showing that star formation can't be really ignored in terms of understanding the, the formation process initially. And there's um, some support for this uh, observationally as well. Um, in fact, there's a quite a lot of support because we see a lot of these encounters, a lot of evidence for these encounters happening in systems. Um, uh, one of the things that one of the systems that I worked on um, was the HV Tau triple system, which is apparently unassociated by this this uh, fourth star, Do Tau, by about 12,000 AU. Um, but then uh, in in 2013, Howard et al. looked in the Herschel um, around this system and saw this bridge. So you can see this bridge in the 100 micron, 160 micron extending between them. And this seems to be consistent with a quadruple interaction in which the, the two disks, there's a disk around one of the stars in the HV system and there's a disk around Do Tau, which could have interacted and, 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 uh, and given rise to this bridge um, about 0.1 million years ago. And this is sort of consistent with this idea of you have a higher order multiple chaotically decays uh, and um, uh, and truncates the disks. Uh, there are many other examples of this and a couple from the literature are RW Origa by Dyatal in 2015 and UX Tau more recently by Menard um, uh, just this year. Um, but yeah, we see quite a lot of these happening and these are happening in low density environments. So these aren't just random encounters. These seem to be part of the star formation process itself. Um, so back to external flows of operation, and we can talk about uh, what are the signatures that we see of perhaps external flows of operation going on in local protoplanetary disk populations. Um, and, and the two of the things I'm going to talk about is uh, how we can potentially use them to constrain star formation physics, but also how we can, uh, how we can use observation of these, these disks to actually constrain physical processes, and particularly angular momentum transport in protoplanetary disks. So hopefully, hopefully I can make that, um, make that argument um, to you. So uh, returning to the Orion Nebula cluster again, which is sort of often used as the archetype for external photo operation. It's close, it's around 400 parsecs away, even though it only has one O star, it's, it's a fairly massive one, 37 solar masses. Um, and, and so you have these very high FUV fields and you have these beautiful propids. Um, uh, so, but there's a problem. There's a problem in interpreting uh, the, the, the protoplanetary disk that we see in the Orion Nebula cluster, and that is that the mass loss rates that are measured for these propylids um, are 10 to the minus 7 or 10 to the minus 6 solar masses per year. Uh, and this sort of suggests that they should be destroyed in less than a million year, but 80% of the disks are still there. Um, and even though the, the, the average age of the cluster is, is sort of around a few million years, but so how can we reconcile this? How can we reconcile these observations with the theory? Um, and I think that the answer probably lies in uh, in the fact that actually we also see a stellar age gradient in the Orion Nebula cluster. So this has been documented for a while. I don't know why the, the references have got a bit smaller, but Hillenbrand in, in 1997 and Hillenbrand showed that there was um, the younger stars were preferentially in the center of the Orion Nebula cluster. This has been demonstrated by a few authors since. One of the more recent studies, um, Bakari et al. in 2017, showed actually that there might even be three stellar populations, three distinct stellar populations spread by about a million years each. Um, and and those, those that are the youngest, again, are more centrally concentrated. So this might be a sort of bursty star formation going on over a period. And what, what I, I spent some time doing was to actually model this in terms of, um, in, in terms of the end body and then coupling them again with the same viscous disk evolution model that I referred to earlier. So the idea is if the stars form over an extended period, uh, then there must be a gas reservoir from which they're forming. Uh, in this case, just from in, from the end body perspective, if you just uh, if you just form say three generations of stars, but it could work over a over a generation, your initial generation of stars will um, presumably cold collapse due to the the potential of the the gas potential that still remains in your in your system. And, and in this toy model, then those, those collapsing stars will then accelerate each other by dynamical interactions within a, within a core. 
And then as you remove that gas potential again, so this is, uh, so in this figure here, we can see um, where I've moved the, removed the gas potential and added a new generation of stars by these dotted vertical lines. And then uh, R50 is just the half mass radius of different populations. So each population added, what you can see for different assumed star formation efficiencies is you get this segregation uh, of the three populations. You naturally produce the younger stars towards the center, um, the younger stars migrate inwards, and in the older stars, as you've removed this potential and um, they're allowed to expand outwards. And depending on your assumed efficiency, you can get different degrees of, of segregation. Uh, and if you combine this with interstellar ex extinction, what you actually do find is, um, is a high diffraction the the present uh, present day. So the dash line is the approximate um, the dash uh, horizontal line is the approximate diffraction uh, in the in the core of the Orion Nebula cluster, and then what we can see are these um, these trajectories depending again on your star formation efficiency um, in terms of the the fraction of surviving disks within this model. Just tracking these 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 disks, um, uh, and essentially you can achieve using this mechanism you can achieve quite high diffractions at the present day. Um, so this also explains uh, explains the sort of slightly bizarre um, finding recently uh, by Josh Eisner et al. in 2018 that they, they found that in the core of the, the ONC, they used these ALMA observations, these flux, these continuum observations, um, and, and compared the, the disk mass with the stellar mass, uh, the stellar host mass, and showed that actually there didn't seem to be much dependence uh, of the disk mass on the stellar host mass. And this is in direct contrast to other regions of a similar age where we see um, a linear or actually mostly super linear relationship between the stellar mass and the, and the flux. So actually you'd expect um, uh, much more massive disks around more massive stars. But this isn't found in the Orion Nebula cluster. And my explanation for this is actually what we're not looking at is we're not looking at one population of stars. We're looking at uh, either an extended period of star formation or, or three distinct sets. It doesn't really make, make so much of a difference, but the point is that in this, in this ideal, then you have, because you have mass segregation, you have the lowest, the lowest mass disks, um, uh, which are also associated with higher mass stars that have been mass segregated, um, are sitting, uh, are there for your older population. So they, they sit here in this, in this, on these brown points here. So they're low mass, but they're around high mass stars. Some of your lower mass uh, stars have lost their disk. Um, and uh, then for your younger population, you still have higher mass, uh, higher mass disks because they haven't had time to be depleted yet, but they're sitting around lower mass stars. And what you get if you fit this whole population as one population, you recover this flat disk mass host mass relationship. So this is telling us that maybe if, if, we, if we look at these disk masses and, and in, in regions like this, this can tell us something about actually the star formation history potentially. And, um, and we should we should be trying to unravel exactly whether these populations um, correspond to, to different disk masses, perhaps in, in the Orion Nebula cluster. Um, just to very briefly touch on on other evidence for external photoapparition happening, I won't I won't go into it in detail, but we see this in uh, this is OBE association Cygnus OB2 um, by Guachalo et al. in 2016. They had a look at the the fraction of surviving disks as a function of the FUV flux that they experienced just from the projected FUV flux. Uh, and they find a clear monotonic decrease as you increase the FUV flux a disk is exposed to, you reduce the fraction of surviving disks. Um, and, and given that Cygnus OB2 is a particularly low density region, this can't really be um, uh, dynamical encounters between stars. This really is sort of pointing towards, um, pointing towards uh, FUV or, or EUV, but probably FUV induced photo evaporation uh, of the protoplanetary disks uh, in that region. We can also see uh, dust mass depletion in, in the Orion Nebula cluster or around the Orion Nebula cluster. So Van Terviska um, et al. Uh, last year showed that uh, disks that are separated by about 0.5 parsecs or a parsec away from that massive star theta 1c that we mentioned. Um, you can see that here in the, these are the ones in brown, uh, are significantly more massive than the, than, than the Eisner et al. sample that, that are found right in the core of the Orion Nebula cluster. So this is really suggesting that um, that there's a uh, there's a there's a depletion going on um, by the by the photo evaporation of the dust um, within within the protoplanetary disk and the Orion Nebula cluster. Um, there's another region in which there's clear evidence of photo evaporation. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Sigma Orionis. Um, so Sigma Orionis is a bit older. It's a three to five million year old region, 
And the protoplanetary disks are irradiated by about a 15 solar mass star, so a slightly smaller star, a uh, lower mass star. Uh, in 2009, Rigliaco et al. Uh, find evidence of uh, photoapparative winds being driven. And, um, and Anstel et al. in 2017 did a, an ALMA survey of the protoplanetary disks and found a, a sort of similar trend as we just saw in that the dust, um, the dust masses of disks was um, depleted within about 0 0.3, 0 0.4 parsecs from the, from the host, from, um, from Sigma Ori. So we can see this sort of, yeah, so, so it seems that again that we see um, depletion in, in Sigma Orionis. Uh, so I did the similar exercise here as to, to show that, um, that you can explain this, uh, this gradient in disk masses essentially again by, this, um, by a fairly simple model, just a dynamical model tracking the disks again um, and, uh, and, and calculating the evolution. You get it after about 5 million years, you get a pretty similar distribution of disk masses. Um, but what we can do with these sort of disks in, in this sort of environment is actually start to probe angular momentum. And this is, this is a sort of um, something that I'm hoping that, that um, some observers can, can, can help me with in the future. Um, but the, we have a real problem in protoplanetary disks. One of the key aspects of any planet formation model is, um, is how angular momentum is redistributed throughout the protoplanetary disk. And this is, this is a really crucial sticking point in terms of understanding planet formation. Um, it's really difficult to constrain how angular momentum is transported because, um, because there are a lot of observational issues in determining how disk radii change over time. And particularly, so this is a paper by um, Giovanni Rizzotti et al. in, in 2019. They looked at um, how uh, the disk grain distribution, for example, um, the, the, the grain size distribution in the disk, uh, in a theoretical model, you expect this sort of grain size to decrease at, at larger radii within a protoplanetary disk. This gives you a, a, essentially a, a cliff in opacity, in the opacity of your dust grains, uh, which means that essentially the, the radius that you measure, if you choose a 68% flux or a 95% flux radius, you get very different answers in terms of whether you see evidence of viscous spreading. Just within a viscous model, the, the, the disk itself is spreading, but because of the observational effects, uh, as well as the physical effects of where the, where the dust evolves to, you can really get very different answers. So it's not clear from dust measurement, dust um, radius measurements, whether you can um, determine how the angular momentum is redistributed in these protoplanetary disks. Gas, um, the, the gas disks radii might, might offer a better, better hope here, but they are much more difficult to, to measure in, in terms of the uh, detections um, with, with even ALMA. Um, so, so we are sort of a little bit stuck in terms of um, trying to constrain how angular momentum is distributed in the outer part of the protoplanetary disk. So, uh, so, so a method that I'm sort of been proposing is that uh, we use the, the wind-induced mass loss rates within these protoplanetary disks uh, to constrain angular momentum transport. So especially for an older region, eventually, Within, the, within any environment, you're, if a viscous model is appropriate, then the mass flux that is, uh, the, the flux of mass that's redistributed by the viscous torques within the protoplanetary disk must be balanced by the wind driven um, by the external, externally driven wind by, by a neighboring o, OB star. So in a region such as Sigma Orion, so in this, in this figure here, I've got the sort of accretion rates on the, um, on the Y axis and the, the wind mass loss rate on the x-axis. Uh, and I've compared the sort of previous model uh, from the Orion Nebula cluster um, to Sigma Orionis. And uh, in the ONC case, we see there are several cases where the wind mass loss rates are very high as we, as we do observe in the ONC. Um, but we do see this begin to settle down onto a, onto a clear relationship um, between the wind and the accretion rate, but this is being depleted your wind mass loss rate is higher than your accretion rate. So this means the outer radius is being depleted. Um, eventually this should settle in, down into, a, into, a, into an equilibrium state where your accretion rate is roughly balanced by your wind mass loss rate. Um, so if we, if we don't find evidence of this correlation, this strong correlation, which, which has to occur within a viscous model, um, then this is ruling out viscous angular momentum transport throughout a disk. And, and at that point, then we, we have a, a strong constraint on on uh, the models on how angular momentum transport is, is um, uh, proceeds in the outer regions of a, of a protoplanetary disk. Um, 
So uh, I'm just for the for the last part of of this talk, I'm going to actually talk about how we might start to um, actually make links to the observed exoplanetary system. So, so far, I've just been talking about formation environment and how we expect um, protoplanetary disks to respond in, in different environments. But now I'm going to talk about how we can make the first steps towards linking that to the actual observed exoplanet population. Um, so, so again, we've got this figure with uh, the semi-major axis and the planet mass. Um, we've got the solar system planets on here. And we want to we want to think about how we can use, uh, for example, maybe Gaia to delineate uh, high density and low density planetary systems. Um, but there are a number number of problems with this, uh, and the first one is that most planets uh, are much older than you know, the most planets that are known about have been uh, older than a giga year. They're in systems older than a giga year. So we can ask whether we can delineate uh, those those that formed in high density regions at that kind of age. And we also have the problem that we have inhomogeneous detection biases that I touched on earlier um, within, this, within this planetary sample. Um, so the first question is stellar kinematics. Is there any sustained substructure? Uh, do we expect stars that form in high density regions to continue to have some kind of substructure, some kind of high density in position velocity space. And this is, I don't think this is, this is, uh, this is clear even still. Um, but, um, Andrew, uh, we, uh, we have a question from yeah. Andrew Uden, um, who asks, uh, why is the ratio of disc to wind accretion one? I guess disk okay. accretion to wind mass loss, but yeah. Okay, yeah. Sorry, point. sorry. So okay, maybe I wasn't clear enough. Okay, so the idea is so these so these models are always um, viscous in terms of the, so so that we use an alpha viscous uh, an alpha viscosity disk where the where the mass flux through the disk is conserved. So your accretion rate onto the central star is determined by um, your mass flux inwards, and your um, and you also have a mass flux outwards throughout the disk. But this mass flux is is um, is is constant throughout the disk. Um, so at some point, once you've depleted the outer part of the disk, if you if you have rapid mass loss in, at the beginning, then you would expect the the disk to be rapidly truncated. But at some point, the disk should be sufficiently truncated so that your your viscous angular momentum transport outwards is balanced by the wind mass loss rate, which is essentially then a boundary condition. Does is that does that make it clear? Yeah, maybe we should talk after. I guess I still don't see why a constant mass flux or M dot is required once you have sort of local lo losses due to a uh, wind. Um, it's it's not it's not due to the losses due to the wind. It's just that um, you need to have the wind being replenished by something. If you just allow the wind to deplete the disk, eventually the the um, the mass loss rate would become inefficient because uh, when you get close to the central star, uh, you're you're in a deeper potential well. So you, the the wind can't can't launch um, it can't launch the the uh, the, the, F, the UV flux can't launch uh, winds efficiently. But maybe we can talk about that afterwards. Yeah. So um, so yeah. So we have inhomogeneous detection bias, and we want to we want to identify um, a substructure for. Uh, a kinematic substructure around exoplanet hosts that are uh, older than around a giga year old. Um, uh, so the first question is, can we, is there any evidence of sustained substructure uh, for stars um, older than a giga year? There is some evidence that, um, that you, you do get this correlation between, um, between the metallicities of stars, their positions and their velocities. So this is paper by Harshal Kandar uh, last year, which is very interesting, looking at using his uh, simulations, um, which predicted essentially co-moving pairs, which, the, which well, I think was defined as um, those that were moving at uh, a, a delta velocity, uh, similar velocities within two kilometers per second and within 20 parsecs of each other. Um, and they predicted that some of those persist going through a realistic sort of galactic potential, although the limitations, of course, in the granularity and, and star formation physics. But, but they predicted that, uh, that some of these, these co-moving pairs persist for several giga years. If you look at um, 
the co-moving pairs in, in Gaia data and, um, and compare this to, to, metal, to, to surveys like the MOST, uh, you can look at the sort of iron over hydrogen um, ratios, the, the difference between, uh, between co-moving pairs. And you see this excess, um, which is present in both the simulations and in the, 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 the Gaia data and all the Gaia and MOST data. Um, so there's a few different versions of this plot. I've just chosen one of them, but you can see that um, you can either you can either choose uh, stars that are within. So in this case, they've chosen stars that are between two and twenty parsecs of each other, uh, and have similar temperatures, um, effective temperatures, and looked at the uh, fraction of pairs um, which have similar metallicities uh, within a given uh, velocity sphere, if you like, um, sort of volume and velocity space. Uh, and as you reduce this velocity space, you can see this clear excess at very close velocities in, in the number of pairs that have very similar metallicities. Um, so this is suggesting that there is, there, there is a um, sustained substructure. There's a lot of other um, uh, uh, um, drivers of substructure within um, uh, stellar kinematics, such as resonances, and you have, you have galactic ties that can disperse uh, co-moving groups. You have inhomogeneous groups. Um, but, but we can say that there are some hints that there might be some old conatal neighbors in, in uh, simulations in the MOST guide data. Uh, and you might, this might support a slow dissolution of co-moving groups um, for dense star forming regions. Um, so with that in mind, we can ask how we can look at correlations uh, in the exoplanet data. So there are two ways to look for correlations in, in such a heterogeneous uh, data set, such as the exoplanet, um, the NASA exoplanet archive. Uh, the one that is, is nearly always used is uh, to, to isolate a single survey, model the completeness uh, of, your, of that survey uh, for a given set of uh, uh, planet properties, and then, uh, and then uh, compare that to a model. So you run your model through it, um, the other way is to split a sample up in a way that isn't observationally biased between the surveys. So if you have a, another data set, which, um, which you can use to then split up the sample uh, in a way that isn't biased between different surveys, then that is another valid way of, of detecting uh, correlations in exoplanet data. Um, the problem with isolating to a single survey in terms of looking for um, environmental effects, then this has to be done with, with the Kepler planets only. Um, these, these, these Kepler planets are distant, um, and, and once you get to high distances, then you have very few well-sampled radio velocity neighborhoods, uh, and you start to, to lose your substructure as well. Um, so so this, this adds, a, adds a new challenge, and um, you also have only a very small region of planet property space. These are, the, the Kepler sample is, is nearly all confined to within 0.5 or 1 AU. Um, and because they're low mass and close in mostly, these are also probably the least likely planets to have been environmentally affected, uh, environmentally affected in the in the first place, because they're they're sitting close to the the host star, where they're presumably among the safest planets um, to any environmental uh, uh, impact that 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 has taken place. So we can't really do this first one, but what we can try and do is split a sample in a way that isn't observationally biased between surveys. Uh, and so the requirements of any such a process is that we need a way, first of all, we need a way to identify substructure surrounding these uh, giga year old systems. Um, and we need a method for which we can maximize the sample size available to us. Um, we, we, need a, we need a system which isn't spatially, strongly spatially biased, and this is so that we, we can identify, we, we aren't essentially biased between different surveys. If we're not strongly spatially biased, then we can um, compare between surveys because different surveys may look at different parts of the sky. Uh, and therefore, if you're just picking up, uh, you're just picking up substructure in a certain part of the sky and not others, then you may just be picking up survey biases. Um, and the other thing is we need to control for host star properties. But what we don't need to do, uh, and this is, this is almost more important than what we do need to do, is we don't need to attribute um, a given star to a specific co-moving group or cluster. And we don't need to, to if, we, if we do, if we, uh, if we make sure that we're not biased between surveys, we don't need to restrict ourselves to a single survey. Um, so with that in mind, um, the, the approach I've taken is to decompose the, 
the density in a six dimensional space. Um, uh, so in position and velocity space. And we do this just through this metric, this Mahalanobis distance, which is essentially the distance between any two points um, divided by the covariance metric uh, matrix. Um, so uh, the, this is uh, X and Y are in six dimensional space. Uh, and then this uh, C is just the covariance matrix uh, of it within a given neighborhood. Um, and then um, for, for then what you can do is make a, a histogram of the densities within that space um, so, so just defined by this metric. So say you take the 20th closest neighbor and you estimate your, your density from the 20th closest neighbor in an unstructured space, you'd expect that to roughly, roughly look log normal. Um, so there's a demonstration here in terms of some, 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 uh, synthetic populations. So what we've done here in the first, in the first, uh, in the first two plots here, I've just shown there's a sort of, uh, sort of similarly distributed Two neighborhood, two um, district, two populations. One field population, if you like, in blue, and one perturbed population in red. Uh, and then you can see that the that the red one has a smaller velocity dispersion than the blue one. And this is just essentially what substructure would be, would look like. Um, uh, and then if you just uh, consider that as one population, uh, such as in the black one. Okay, so in this case, it's a fairly clear overdensity. Uh, but and then what you what you do is you make a, a histogram of the relative phase space densities of all the stars in this in this in this region, uh, and you you apply a Gaussian mixture model, and you can then pick out essentially your high density and your low density um, environment. And so this so this and the bottom right here this is done blindly on the full sample, uh, and you can pick out again. So but then the the colors are then. Um, uh, given to the 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 um, perturbed sample and the the field sample here again so what you can see here in this case it's it's quite easy to pick out this substructure um, but in other cases you you this might not be the case so we can we can explore how this works for different degrees of perturbation um, uh, and we can see that in okay so in in uh, it, when the density gets low and when the velocity dispersions become comparable then you might overestimate uh, overestimate the amount of substructure in your region. But this is kind of okay. We kind of just want to, to, to delineate what's the most likely high, high density regions and the most likely low density regions. What we do do um, throughout all of these sort of different kinds of um, perturbation of parameter space is that you always retrieve with high probability, you always retrieve your, your sort of field cells, if you like, those in low densities. Um, so, so we can apply this uh, to, um, to 40 parsec neighborhoods of exoplanet host stars. And we choose old, old one, old um, stars which are not strongly clustered in space. So these are not bound clusters. These are neighborhoods which don't include bound clusters. They're just, um, they're just, uh, uh, they're just forty parsec neighbor, uh, neighborhoods around known exoplanet host stars. Uh, and this this method is is practically independent of spatial location. We get pretty similar um, cuts between the high density and the low density in each in each spatial location. Um, and what we can see is three examples here, three exoplanet host stars, uh, and we can see how this, this effectively works. So in, in, the, in the top plot here, we just have this, again, this histogram in relative phase space density. Uh, and in the bottom plot, what we have is just the, the, um, the radial and the, the, the azimuthal velocities and the, and the galactic, um, galactic centric coordinates. Uh, and you can see how this sort of picks out uh, at least what looks like substructure around each of these, uh, around each of these um, host stars. Uh, and we can sort of do this categorization then probabilistically of whether this, this host star looks like it's in a low density environment or a high density environment. Um, uh, so, so then after, after controlling for the stellar properties, we're left with, um, with 66 low density, uh, low density stars and 341 high density stars in the mass range 0. 0.7 to 2 stellar masses uh, in terms of the host, host star mass. Uh, and what you can see here, so I've done this decomposition um, in it's so the low density is on the left and the high density is on the right. And what we see immediately is that these distributions look very different. And particularly the, the, main, the main takeaway message from this is that we, we're looking at a significantly uh, more hot Jupiters in high density environments than low density environments. There's a factor approximately two. Um, of those in the low density environments, um, half of the half of those uh, hot Jupiters and low density environments also seem to have substellar companions. So this is this is a really interesting interesting result. And 
uh, we can just uh, go back to look at the, the individual properties. Um, and we, what we can do is we can do a control experiment, which is basically by taking a, a star uh, around each of these exoplanet hosts uh, and then reassigning the density of that exoplanet host based on, uh, based on the, the decomposition of that, uh, of that star rather than the host itself. Um, then you can see whether you get a false positive result, essentially. So this is saying if certain surveys are looking in certain regions and those biases, uh, those surveys are biased in a certain way, and they're also picking up certain exoplanets, could this be responsible for our results? And the answer is is no. This this wouldn't give us um, a false positive because we and we we've, we've done this. So these are these um, faint lines, and we've repeated this experiment hundreds of times. Uh, and seen that uh, the, the distribution of, if you were to do a KS test and compare these, you would not get a significant result. Uh, whereas we, we get highly significant results in semi-major axis and orbital period. Um, eccentricity that mostly traces the high instance of hot Jupiters actually um, at further out, at further distances. Um, so the, the sort of cold Jupiters, if you like, uh, this, this, this uh, relationship actually inverts. But um, we also get hints of uh, an excess of lower mass and lower radius planets as well uh, in the high densities, high density, um, high density sample. Um, so how does this link in physically um, with, with sort of uh, formation mechanisms uh, for potentially hot Jupiters? Uh, so an interesting paper, paper this year by Lee et al. Uh, demonstrated that if you have a uh, multiplicity within a, uh, an n-body simulation or a, or a Monte Carlo simulation of, of, of a cluster, this increases the encounter cross-section dramatically. And what you can end up with was even for very low density environment or, or very moderate density environments that you'd expect maybe for open clusters, 50 stars per qubit parsec, about 10% um, end up with captured binaries with these, these hot Jupiter companions, um, with, these, with, these hot, with, these, um, with these Jupiters. And these can then excite the orbits of your Jupiters, uh, and uh, the, the binary companion then may later be stripped by, by subsequent encounters. But once, once you've excited these orbits, once you've excited these eccentric orbits of these hot Jupiters, so sorry, this, this plot here, this figure here, um, you can follow this green line, and this is the probability of um, uh, uh, the sort of um, the uh, the binding of a, a tertiary star to a hot Jupiter star um, pair, uh, depending on the binary fraction uh, that you start with within 100 million years and for a, for a density of 50 stars per parsec. And you can see this is approximately 10% for, for fairly moderate binary fractions even. Um, so yeah, so, so once we have an eccentric orbit, you can, you can appeal to something like tidal circularization, which you expect um, due to uh, uh, Jupiter uh, raising tides on the host star, this tidal circularization can then result in a migration of the orbit inwards uh, and you can end up with a hot Jupiter. Um, another interesting study that's been done on this recently, there's been a lot of studies or not a lot of, there's been a few studies which have indicated that there's this correlation again between multiplicity and hot Jupiters. Uh, most recently, Belukarov um, et al. Uh, looked at the sort of the chi-squared um, fitting of a single star model to the, to the Gaia DR2 kinematics. And they use this wobble, uh, this poor, poor fit in the, in, the, in the DR2 kinematics to indicate, to show that, um, to indicate the presence of a, of a binary system, of an unresolved binary. And they've applied this um, to, in terms of Jupiter hosts. And you can see in the blue line is regular, regular Jupiter hosts. And then the, the red line is for hot Jupiter hosts. Uh, and you can see that there's this excess in, um, in the, in the chi-squared, which indicates a higher binary, binary fraction. And this isn't attributed, uh, attributable to the hot Jupiters themselves. There's also this, this study by Fontenay um, et al. last year. And they found that they, have, they actually see an 80% binary fraction um, for hot Jupiter hosts um, with, with uh, wide, or, uh, with wide uh, separations of 20 to 10,000 AU. Uh, so this is really indicating that, um, that dynamics seem like a really promising avenue down which um, hot Jupiters may be formed. So I'll just briefly conclude. Um, the main conclusion is that planets really do not form in isolation. Uh, and this is really important for understanding exoplanet demographics, really important for modeling. It's, uh, it, it seems more and more unlikely that you can really model uh, the observed exoplanet population by a single continuous distribution. Um, uh, 
So, uh, so other other conclusion include that encounters appear to be a common consequence of the star formation process, um, and and we know that many stars and planets are sort of born in in high in UV high environments that are high enough to to deplete protoplanetary disks, um, and we can use such a radiated disk to, to to constrain both star formation and planet formation models. And finally. It's looking more and more likely that hot Jupiters uh, actually originate from a dynamical perturbation, perhaps rather than um, rather than migration through a, through a protoplanetary disk. And I'll stop there. Thanks very much. Yeah, I've got to unmute myself. Thank you for an interesting talk. I think everybody can unmute themselves now and give an applause if they want to. <laughs> Thank you. Um, are there any questions uh, that people would like to ask? Yeah, so I see a, a hand raised by Maxwell. Yes, Andrew, thank you for your uh, wonderful talk. Um, question, uh, I'll do a comment first and then a question. Um, the, the question, the comment is, um, so yeah, so there's a lot of these studies that have found that hot Jupiter's hosts have an excess of, uh, wide binaries and, uh, Caitlin Crowder and I looked at that and found that it was a selection effect, um, where, uh, because closed binaries suppress the formation of hot Jupiter's, you actually, um, see that, uh, hot Jupiter hosts should have a higher occurrence rate of, of wide solar companions compared to field stars. Um, and so we uh, discussed that and there's actually a, a more recent paper, Hawain et al, of this year that confirmed that result that uh, these uh, wide binaries don't seem to influence the formation of uh, hot Jupiters. Um, but my question is, again, on this, this latter part of your study, you were talking about hot um, Jupiter occurrence rates as a function of the 60 phase uh, density. Is it fair to say that you're not measuring the current rates, you're just measuring the ratio, of, let's say cool Jupiters to hot Jupiters as a function of 60 phase? Yeah, so no, so the only the only thing I'm the only thing that I'm measuring is the relative numbers in in high density versus low density. Anything more than that would be subject to, to selection biases uh, and you wouldn't be able to do this uh, do this kind of study because what you can do is you can compare between two split samples, but you can't uh, necessarily compare within one sample. So no, I don't have occurrence rates of hot Jupiters, just the relative numbers. So it could be that hot Jupiters are independent of uh, 60 phase density, it could be that cool Jupiters, the current rate of cool Jupiters are smaller in high density environments. Uh, yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, it could be. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, so another hand raised by Hilke. Hi, Andrew. Um, interesting talk. I am curious, how do you explain the resonances that we see amongst hot Jupiter and other gas giants if they didn't undergo any disk migration? Um, so my answer, so specifically specifically hot Jupiters or? They... Yeah, right, because we do see them. I mean, these are the one planetary systems where we do see them quite commonly being in mean motion resonances. Um, and they are typically hot Jupiters or close in gas giants with other gas giants. Uh, so, I mean, okay, well, so I, I wasn't actually aware that the hot Jupiters themselves were uh, commonly in, in mean motion resonances. I didn't realize that that was the case. I, I, what I would say in general is that this doesn't rule out, this isn't, this isn't ruling out migration as a, as a mechanism for, for, well, for formation of anything really, but it's, but what I'm suggesting is that the migration wouldn't take you from tens of AU to 0.1 AU. It might take you from, it, from tens of AU to, to, to some further out distance, but it wouldn't, Take you right into to the to the central uh, to, to orbits uh, so close to the central star, but I did not. I I'm afraid that's just a lack of my uh, uh, holding my knowledge. I did not know that uh, there was um, that there was an excess in mean motion resonances among hot Jupiters specifically. I don't. Uh, could you could you would you be able to link me um, some papers for that? Well, the the very famous ones are the early ones, right, from like the early two thousands, because you can actually measure their libration. I don't remember all, the, all of them by name, but uh, yeah, 
the I think it's the one systems where we have some confidence <laughs> yeah. that they actually do tend to care about the resonances um, in a in a significant way. <laughs> Um, but I think I think what your answer is, I mean, I think it's true. It doesn't tell you that, um, it doesn't tell you the distance over which they migrated, but it seems to suggest, at least for those that we do see in these two to one mean motion resonances, um, that what, somehow they were captured. What kind of, what kind, what kind of numbers of hot Jupiters are in, in that configuration? I didn't... Uh... I, I also don't know from the top of my head, but I know there's several systems that are well studied where you can actually measure their elaboration. So they, you not only know that the period ratio is two to one, <laughs> but you can see them elaborate as well. What I, what, I would say, what I would say about this in general, so this isn't something, this is pure speculation. This isn't, um, this isn't, uh, this isn't really rooted in very much at all. But uh, what, what I would say is that um, encounters early on, if, if, if it is to do with multiplicity and, and binaries and, um, and encounters, then um, it is entirely possible to have disconduced migration that is also the result of a, an encounter. Um, you still have to come up with a reason why hot Jup some hot Jup some Jupiters migrate and some don't, and some planets migrate and some don't. Uh, and one possible solution would be that if in these, these regular encounters that happen very early on, and this is where you'd expect the majority of these encounters to happen, then uh, those encounters could induce this migration because you immediately put a, a forming Jupiter, if they form early, you could put it on a highly eccentric orbit and that would induce, um, could then uh, uh, induce disk migration with, with dynamical encounters. But again, that's, that's, pure, that's pure speculation. Then we have a question from Heis. Uh, hi. Um, yeah, this is a really interesting effect from the of the dependence of exoplanets on the phase space. So I'm I'm still a bit puzzled about your sort of bias correction. But I was wondering, uh, you said that only for Kepler there are enough sort of that's the only homogeneous survey where you can apply a completeness correction. But I think radial velocity surveys have also you know published occurrence rate, published completenesses. They're typically a bit smaller, right? They have like a hundred planets. So so have you looked into like would those surveys be large enough? to basically directly measure this in a single survey or not? Uh, so I, I haven't done that. So as far as I know, the issue with that is that, well, so I, as, as far as I know, most radial velocity surveys don't publish their lower limits. Is that, is that true? I'm not 100% sure. Okay, so that was my understanding of, of, of that situation. So, so your problem does become that you become quite so because of the decompos the, the, the nature of the decomposition, and you try to you want to be very sure about this being in as in in a, in a low density environment specifically. Your issue is at the low density end. Um, yeah, your numbers, your statistics do become challenging when you when you do this for for a smaller number. But in terms of the bias, the bias, I understand that bias correction is is a hugely important thing in in demographics studies. Um, my argument here is that you, in order to, you can do this in two different ways. You can either do it through, um, through a bias correction, or you can do this by being sure that when you split a sample up, you do it in a way that isn't biased between different surveys. So if you have a survey looking at a given star in a given region of the sky, there is no, um, there's no difference in the probability that that star, just because of that in, in that field of view, would be attributed to a high density or a low density environment. That's the, the key difference. Right. So, so would you be able to do this with like, if you only had like a hundred planets rather than I think the thousands you've probably used? Uh, no, you, you would not be able to do this with a hundred planets. No, I don't think. Um, yeah, then, you, you, then it would be hard the, with radio velocities. The, 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 the radio, radio velocities, you have a better chance of being able to do it um, because, because you have a higher number of, uh, with uh, radio velocity data in Gaia. But uh, I think you'd need, you'd need larger samples. Okay, thank you. Okay, then we have a question from Andrew. Um, yeah, hi, Andrew. Andrew here. Uh, nice talk. Um, so thanks for your clarification. I think I now understand that point that the, the viscous secretion applies, you know, mostly at large radii, whereas the wind are at smaller radii. Um, 
but uh, the question I had was was kind of a follow up to your reply to Max. Could you go back to your uh, contour plots, the red and blue from the low and high density environments uh, with the different populations? So since you said that these are relative, I mean, you interpreted this as a, a lack of hot Jupiters on the blue side, but given that the uh, lower mass planets are also rare and blue. It, it kind of looks more to me like the other thing you, you mentioned in, in the reply, that it's more like an excess um, of, uh, of cold Jupiters. Yeah, to be, to be honest with you, yeah, I've, because of the, the way that the literature was going uh, in terms of my interpretation, I immediately went to an excess of hot Jupiters because of because of some of the because of the literature I was reading but actually you're you're probably entirely right it could easily be the other way around um uh and certainly I think there's physically I think that there's certainly going to be some threshold at which um hot Jupiters uh or Jupiters in general high mass planets can't form um around around planetary systems because at some point I really uh, I think it's extremely unlikely that these these um, these FUV fluxes, these high UV fields, don't dramatically shorten the, the disk lifetimes. And we see a lot of evidence of this actually happening uh, and actually depleting the disk all the way down to, to well, de destroying the disk. Um, so I think that in, in general, actually, uh, if you, if I don't, I don't know the answer to this, but at some point you would expect a, a sufficiently high density that it should suppress high mass planet formation completely. Um, so yeah that might be actually a better interpretation of, of what we're seeing here. And then we have another question from the chat. So I will read it up from Neil Turner. Um, he's asking if you could say more about the link between uh, disk inflow and wind outflow rates and yep. at what locations are these two measured in your picture? Uh, so, so this, so, it, it, sorry, this is is this is this this what is what being is what's uh, being referred to, right? This, I think so. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, um, so the idea is that if you had, so again, it's not a position at which it's being measured. Uh, it's uh, in general the, the 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 wind would be say if you measured it in the H alpha or whatever whatever line you chose to to measure the wind in. Uh, then you should detect uh, a mass loss rate as long as you're outside of the sonic point. You should detect um, a, a mass loss rate, which is balanced by the the amount of material which is replenished viscously or in, in whatever way that it's being replenished by the disk. So as the as the flow of material comes out, at some point the 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 um, the the FUV induced or the UV induced mass loss rate becomes very inefficient because as you deplete the disk down to very small radii. Uh, it, it's just impossible for the winds to be, be launched by these um, by these UV fields. So all that we're saying is that once once you've sheared the disk down to a certain radius, it has to be. It doesn't matter where you're where you're measuring this mass loss rate. As long as you're measuring the true mass loss rate in the wind, it has to be balanced by the if if the accretion is also viscously driven, it has to be balanced by the uh, by the accretion onto the onto the central side. If you have an alpha disk model, if you don't have an alpha disk model, if you have uh, say uh, MHD effects that are causing your accretion onto your central star, then you don't expect this at all because your disk will just be depleted down to some radius. And at that point, it will precipitously, the, the wind induced mass loss rate will just precipitously drop because the wind, it would just won't be efficient anymore. Um, you won't be able to replenish the material at the outer part of the disk. Uh, so, so yeah, so that's, that's the, the, the thinking behind that, um, that, that test. I think we got another question from Caitlin. Yeah, so just uh, following up on that last thing you said, I mean, isn't the issue just that you need some mechanism to resupply mass at large radii? Does it, I mean, is, is like it being an alpha disk model particularly relevant? It's just that you need well, yeah. something continuing to bring mass in. Yeah, sure. So any, 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 um, any uh, angular momentum redistribution uh, model whereby your uh, your mass flux is constant throughout the disk will give you the same result. It doesn't matter what mechanism that is. Um, so yeah, it's not going to tell you what the mechanism is. What it will tell you is if you're if you're removing angular momentum from the disk or not. Uh, so if the accretion rate is driven by some by a mechanism which 
magnetic braking or, 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 or so on that's removing angular momentum from the disc over time. That's what it will help to, to differentiate. Right, so I guess I'm saying the, the, the constancy of the mass flux isn't you know, necessarily telling you about a viscous alpha-like disc model, just that there's a large scale yep. resupply. So again, like, like you're saying, if you had large scale disc winds, you could have a purely laminar flow and you would still end up seeing this matching because you need the resupply of material. True, uh, true, yeah. So, but if it's if it's a large scale disc wind, then then I don't see why that should be connected directly to an accretion rate, though. Uh, if if it's, yeah. So it needs to be something that's redistributing angular momentum throughout the disc. Um, that's, right, right. That's... but you can have a, a a disc wind transporting angular momentum at large radii and allowing mass to fall in. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. As I say, the, the issue at the moment is that we don't know whether the disc spread or not. That's, that's the, the observation that's, that's lacking. We just don't even know whether over time the outer radius of a disc spreads out or not, because there's contradictory uh, findings on this. Um, so the, the, again, they mostly looked at the, the continuum uh, and that has its own problems, but there's contradictory findings as to whether these discs spread. And this is just a, a, a quite a direct probe of whether that spreading is is, is occurring um, this, uh, or not. Right, right. And actually, so maybe somebody else can remind me, jo Joan Najita uh, gave a talk in this uh, forum a week or two ago, arguing that based on the CO observations that there was an indication that disks were getting bigger in time. Was that published already? Can somebody, maybe maybe Serena remembers? Oh, hi, this is Joan. Joan is actually here. <laughs> I, I didn't see your name, sorry, Joan. No problem. Uh, that was a study from 2018 in AppJ. Uh, and so we just compared published uh, sizes of disks, of class two disks, um, using CO and other indicators, uh, HCN, H2 plus, and with um, the sizes of disks measured with, um, uh, you know, in the PV diagram uh, in class one disks, and the class two disks were similar or much larger. So I, I think that suggests viscous spreading. Yeah, that does. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't, uh, sorry, I wasn't aware of that one, but. Uh, no, check it yeah. out and let me know if you, what you, what your thoughts are. Yeah. Appreciate it, thanks. Yeah. And for the high B uh, environment, as Ryan Boyden and Josh Eisner published a paper about the gas <clears throat> in ONC. That, that uh, I think Ryan is here and Josh is here too, I think. Um, the gas disc was slightly larger than the dust disc in OV Orion, I mean, ONC. Oh, I guess it's not there, but uh, it's a paper 2020 uh, I, I, Eisner, I, I have uh, the Boyden and Eisner. If they're not, if they did you say they're, they're here or not? I, I, I didn't, um, but I, I have read yeah, that. Yeah, I think they may have, yeah, I probably logged off, logged off actually. Okay, so no, I have read that paper. I think that the gas discs are slightly more extended, than, but the trouble is, of course, yeah. with with, um, with that kind of. So I don't know. It would be nice to hear them comment on this actually, because there is a big problem in understanding in understanding the the gas disc radii, especially in that kind of environment. Because if there are disc winds, then you expect some portion of that flow to be molecular, um, and uh, it's not clear where your disc radius ends and your flow region begins uh, necessarily. But I'm sure it'd be nice to hear their thoughts on that, but um, I guess another time. I, I, if, it, if it's okay, can I respond to that? Oh, do Josh may want to say something? Yeah, sorry, and, um, I, I, didn't, I missed the okay. initial question. Serena, Serena's question? Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, the, the, I think it, the gas disc size in, um, the your IMA field that Ryan and you published, uh, it's a larger than the dust disk uh, for your, I think, 23 samples. Yep. So that, yeah, is responding to Andrew's question of that in different environment because Joan's sample and your sample is different environment. So for the external UV, high UV uh, environment, even there, you see the bigger gas disk size. Yeah, the gas disk size. But actually it was a smaller and really near the all star. Well, the gas disk sizes measured in CO are almost always larger than dust sizes in every region. 
So that's mm -hmm. something to keep in mind. There's, there's definitely optical depth effects and density threshold effects that go into that. It may not just be environment dependent, but it's true that I think that's something that's in common in the ONC and other regions is that the gas disc sizes that we measure are larger than the dust disc sizes. And Ryan, I think is here. He could chime in as well if he wants to. I think he might have logged out. It's, it's past one o'clock. So. June, did you have a question, I guess? Oh, sorry. I just I was just intending to say that in Taurus, the gas disc sizes are larger than the dust dust disc by somewhere between two and eight. So they can be significantly larger. Yeah, so, so the argument that I would make about that you'd expect a, a, a less of a discrepancy in someone like the ONC is because you expect, as I say, there to be some kind of balance um, between any kind of angular momentum transport outwards and, 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 uh, and the, the, the wind-induced mass loss rate, and you expect the gas to be um, de depleted uh, down to, to, a, to a certain radius so that then without necessarily affecting the dust so much, so you might expect then the, the 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 difference between your dust radius and your your gas radius to be be smaller, but I don't know whether this is the case exactly. Yeah, I would expect that too. So I think if we're looking for evidence of viscous spreading, it's better to stay away from high UV radiation environments. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Sure. But it, then it, then this is this is a slightly different mechanism in which you're just uh, yeah you're comparing accretion rates to to wind mass loss rates without trying to measure an actual disk extent you, this is independent of your of your disk radius um, or or any of the properties of your disk um, right okay and i think that were a lot of questions <laughs> and then we can uh, thank andrew again and we hope to see uh, everyone next week again by the next uh, during the next origin session yeah. Thank you. Thank all. you. Thanks, so Thanks for a lovely talk. Bye. Bye.